The tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings, who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives, or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbour bitter envy and a selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, uninspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial, and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. I think most of you don't, Jill and I, and um, for those who don't, I, I'm sort of pastor for nearly 60 years in various churches, and uh, it's just a joy now to be retired before I expire. <laughs> <coughs> I'm not likely to expire this afternoon, I don't think, but if I do, in our ministry together, Jill and I, over the churches that we've, every church we have been to, uh, with the exception of joining a, a team in South Africa, every church we've been to was a broken church. By that I mean there had been a church split or there had been division. One church we went to in Leeds, uh, and no one would go there. Uh, we went, and 30 or 40 people had marched out one morning, including the leadership. <coughs> Sadly, it was over the way of worship, which is so often a controversial subject. Uh, our job there was healing. Healing of mind and heart, of healing people for their walk in Christ. And so if what I say today is a little bit downbeat for you, forgive me, it's only I want to bring the other side of our Christian walk. Somebody said to me, you're going to preach the gospel of Christ uh, in all its fullness. Yes, in all its fullness. And ideally, all its fullness will be realised when eventually we arrive in eternity. We will see what it was all about then. We don't know yet. We see through a glass darkly. And some of us don't look in a glass too often, do we? Uh, we try not to anyway. Um, so I want to read a psalm, because I said to Simon, I'd like to go through the psalms. And it's a group of psalms that were sung by pilgrims on the way to the Passover in Jerusalem and to the feasts. And you'd like to think, in walking there, ready for a big praise gathering, massive convention in, in the house of God, that everybody would be very happy. The truth is that sometimes, to use an expression, the rubber hits the road. Sometimes in our lives we want to be different, we want to show that we're praising God, and we are in our hearts. But, as I said to somebody the other day, their daughter has gone through a terrible depression. We hadn't seen her for a long time, but an awful depression. It's easy enough to say what you want to pull out of it, but it's, it's bigger than that. And there are other reasons behind that. But um, uh, my, my friend's wife was saying, you know, she got somebody who said, she's a daughter of the king, remember that? And I said, yes, I believe so. And sometimes you have to walk in reality. And I, I, I'm, I'm a little bit like that, you'll forgive me, but I just wanted to calm it down. She is a daughter of the king, of that I have no doubt. 
but the mum shouldn't feel like it. And there may be reasons for it. What I want to aim at this, this afternoon is that some of the reasons why you and I don't always feel how we should, or how we think we should, is part of our own fault. When we come to Christ, it, we, we like to think, it's all on him and nothing on me. <clears throat> and we make our protestations and we say, yes, I give you everything you want. And I believe that. Some lovely songs today, which we sang. See you with your arms raised and uh, this is not a judgment, this is such an observation. And you want to give everything to Christ. But you also have to face the reality of your life and where you are. And you ignore that at your peril. We grow where we are. It is said of Jesus <coughs> that he grew as a root in a dry ground. I was showing you this Sunday morning about Jesus returning to Nazareth, which was a pretty rough old history. Not mentioned very much in scripture after that. And it was renowned for its uh, a crime and, and low standard of living and all that kind of thing, which we know about in today's generation. And yet in the middle of that, God prepared his son for the walk that eventually would take him, without hesitation, to Calvary for us, for you and for me. So it's growing where you are that's important. And the first psalm I read to you is Psalm 120. It's a very short, short one, and it's to do with the tongue. It's to do with what people say to you. Now, I've been very hurt today. I have to tell you that. I've got, and somebody met me in the corridor and said, Hello, Georgie Pawdry. <laughs> and I, I've been very hurt by because it isn't true that I kissed all the girls and made them cry. It really isn't. I didn't make them cry. <laughs> so don't you, you remember that book? Okay, that's. I didn't say Paul Jane. Sorry. I didn't say Paul Jane. I said Paul Jane. Well, I will add the Paul Jane. Is that all? Right? <laughs> yeah, just joking. I've been called all sorts in my time, and John knows most of those names. Uh, all of them scriptural, of course. <laughs> the man right, Joe was just standing there, I was sitting because my legs are not what they were, and uh, I won't show you, but uh, they're, they're, I can't stand all that long for good reason. And uh, Joe said, Can you see through me? I said, I've seen through all my life. <laughs> That's another story. Someone trying to get that As usual. In my distress, here is someone in the walk. To the convention of Jerusalem with the saints around him all singing and rejoicing and, and what he's really saying it's okay for you but this is how I am feeling Psalm in my distress I cried to the Lord and he heard me deliver me deliver my soul Lord from lying lips and from a deceitful tongue what can I give to him? What can I do about it? I'm paraphrasing now. Sharp arrows? Should I cut my tongue out? He doesn't actually say that, but that's how he's feeling. Oh, woe is me. I'm, I'm living in Miset, which incidentally was again a place of great crime. It was a very dark place to be in. And we all know about the dark place in our lives. And maybe that's where he was at this time. And how he felt. It was a metaphor. I'm dwelling in Mesek, I'm dwelling in a place that's so difficult to live in, and I don't want to be here. And then he went on to say, and I am also dwelling in the tents of Kedar. The tents of Kedar were uh, a tribe that erected their tents and they were black covering. It was pretty dark when you looked out over Kedar. That's where he felt. My soul has, has my, my soul has long dwelt with those that hate peace. I long for peace, I'm for peace. But when I speak, they are for war. And that psalm came to me <clears throat> one, one evening when I was thinking about meeting together today. And really just to ask the question, where are you? It's a big question from Genesis, isn't it? The very first question. Adam, where are you? And you could say that, that and, and, and move that on and say, where are you in your Christian life? There's nothing judgmental. Uh, time together, I'm just asking the question. Are you real about what God is doing for you and has done for you? 
Are you making claims for your life that have not yet been achieved, but are still hopeful and aspiring because of Christ and what he's done? When I was a little boy, and I'm sure you've heard the little rhyme, sticks and stones will break my bones, but names will never hurt me. Actually, that's a lie. Names do hurt. Things have been said to me, and I guess to you too, that have gone right down into your soul, and often, and this may apply to some of you, right from childhood. I heard a mother in Tesco, Tesco, do I go to Tesco's? Yes, I do. <laughs> Would you forgive me if I... <clears throat> at Genesis. Uh, well, I was in Tesco the other day, or, or somewhere, and this uh, lady was speaking to her child who was playing up as children do, not like this, these two. Are they angels? There are some of them I see. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but they were playing up, and, and this, this mother just got hold of the child. Shut up, you stupid child. And you've heard it. And maybe at some stage in your life, you had it said to you. You're just stupid. You're not capable of doing anything. You know, you, your, your, your talents and your abilities are, well, you're useless. And somehow that often grows into our lives until we feel that that is the truth. And when we begin to feel that is the truth, then we begin to go down and reach into our levels. About the Christian life, really, maybe you've been told that um, you're not good enough. The truth is you're not of yourself and never will be. But that's not what God is saying. God is saying you're not good enough, but I am to bring you close to me. But it's that God not good enough. That, I mean, maybe you look at me today and you all wish you were like me, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> and you tell the truth occasionally as well, so are you. <clears throat> what I'm saying is very often, Forget that for a moment. Sam's giving me a halo, but I'll do it somewhere like that in the car park. Um, sometimes we look, and I have looked, at people who are Christians who, in my view, are really, to use the phrase, going on with God. So I said my question that phrase. I'm not quite sure how you analyse that phrase, but I think we know what we mean. And I have wanted to be like that. I've just wanted to, I'm thinking particularly in ministry now, and I think of an elderly man who I knew, he was Welsh, and, and he, he and I used to sit down as a young lad there, not, not quite a young lad, I was in my twenties, just come to the Lord, about to go into ministry. And he used to just talk about heaven to me. And, and, and there was just grace coming from his lips now. I couldn't get enough of listening to him. Hayden Palmer, I remember him now. And he would sit with tears in his eyes talking about Jesus. And, and it affected me, and I thought, Lord, I want to be like him. And then he got caught up in a, in a I don't know if you've ever fasted. Have you ever fasted and prayed? Any? Seriously, any? Yeah. But there was, there was a movement at one time which said about 40-day fasting, which I carefully avoided. But um, <coughs> they, were, they were saying, if you fast for 40 days, God will do this and all that and the other. We've heard a lot of things like that before. I tend to dismiss them, not that fasting is wrong. I mean, I'm going to say prescribing fasting. And Hayden, for his age and his wisdom and his longing for God, got into the self trap and, and did a 40 day fast. And out of that, and this sounds extremely sad, he had such a massive breakdown of health and mind. And there was no way through it for him. And I used to visit him in what was then a what can I call it? Was a second name for her, but I, I used to visit him. And he lost his faith and he lost everything he stood for. He did come back, but because he got on at the wrong time, this is what I must do because somebody else had put it on him. I want to free you today from doing anything that man puts on to you to be a bit of a Christian. I want to free you from looking and putting others on, a, on a, a, an isolated platform, particularly those of us who are public in our ministry, that's a dangerous thing to do. I want you to put anyone who you think is a wonderful idol, put them to one side, pray for them, pray that God will present them, thank God for their, their um, enthusiasm, not now talking about Simon, who wasn't talking about Simon, anyway. But uh, I'm not talking about anybody in particular. I'm just simply saying, don't idolize. Don't, don't measure your life against somebody else. Where are you? Where is the blessedness you knew when first you saw the Lord? 
where is that soul refreshing you of Jesus and his words of said. To go back to that beginning, that, that first love for Christ. And all the promises that were there, which you, you took on board and rightly so. And you began to think they were all for you. We used to sing a little jingle, it was a jingle. Every promise in the book is mine. Every comma, every dot, every line. I'll teach you that one sometime, but don't sing it. <laughs> and we used to believe that the Bible was so written that every comma and every dot in it, of course in the old trans version, um, was, was, you know, God had put every dot there. Well, we won't go to that. I believe in the authority of God's word, of course I do. But I took on board, and you took on board, maybe things that are not yet for you. That is an escape, a spiritual escapism. And I want to tell you that when you do that, and it doesn't work out, I know people have been held by prophecies. With a dear, dear friend of ours, she ought to be a happy mother with children. She is delightful, she is lovely. We should be meeting her this week, she's now in her 60s, and that's all gone by. And she held on to somebody prophesied over her, you are going to marry that man. And she wouldn't look elsewhere. There were people who would, would have loved her. Seriously, I mean, as a Christian, lovely person. But she refused to look. You could say she obeyed God. We would say, somewhere along the line, somebody had held her in a, in a false prophecy. Somebody had screwed her life up. So that all she could do was walk by this, this fearful prophecy that had been And I've seen it. I, we've released people from prophecies. I was forgiven prophecies at times, too, and tested them in the Lord. Where am I you? As you're walking as we are towards towards the glory at some point or another, some will arrive. If I get there before you do, you know, you know the old song. Um, as we walk along together, let's honour one another as as those who love Jesus at whatever level we are at, but help each other somehow to escape from the the clutches, the wrong clutches. I think sometimes the demonic clutches in the guise of spirituality. If it doesn't if it isn't invested in Jesus, if it doesn't come from your salvation, if it does, if you feel today you're not good enough, why are you not good enough? If Christ is in your life. I remember someone said to me one day, I I I can never be forgiven. I said, so what's special about you? And they looked at me. And I said, why are you outside of the orbit of Christ's forgiveness? Why are you so bad that Jesus, when he died, he had to admit you and leave you out? And they began to realise that there was nothing we have done, nothing we can do, nothing we can ever do, that although they grieve him, cannot be forgotten or forgiven. The blood of Christ, that when we sin, it said the blood of Christ cleanses us from every sin. But one of the things that we sometimes say to ourselves, and that's why he was talking about his tongue here, he'd been speaking to himself and said, I shouldn't be with these people, I'm not good enough. Perhaps it was something like, well, where is God in all of this? Why am I feeling this way? Shouldn't I be jumping around? Shouldn't I be, when people around me are singing, as you were today, shouldn't I be involved in that? Shouldn't I be raising my hand? Shouldn't I? I don't feel like it. Can I say to you, Maria? Can I say to you that you can trust God and all of that? Can I say that when, when you begin to feel that way and you put it into your own mind and your heart, you will finish into darkness. You will lose out the light in your life. The light of our life today is that Jesus lives. And that whatever condition you and I are in, mentally, physically, spiritually, if some of it even is our own fault, and some of it is, there is a way through. There is a path back to God through the dark paths of sin. I don't, I don't know. I, I would want to pronounce a blessing over you. I'd like to say we need to bless each other more. Joe read that scripture. Can cursing and blessing come from the same mouth? Sadly, yes, it does. Sadly, when we're, when, when we're saying, where is God and, and why am I like this? Is that not part of almost going back to the curse? We can ask the question, but we mustn't take it on board. God is still God. God is always faithful to his word. God in Christ loves you and loves me. It says in this psalm that he wanted to live in peace. Remember the lovely promise in the word of God which says that 
that Jesus said, my peace I leave with you, that the world cannot take away. And we talked about this in the the other night, actually. We talked about facing reality. Now, it's, a, it's something I'm all about. You know? Facing reality, reality in our minds and, and, and seeing where we're at. And, and, and yet, believing that, that God has given us peace. And Joe came up with, and it was, it was lovely what he said, love, was that whilst we don't always feel that peace, it is there and it is surrounding us. And the lovely word in scripture is that the peace of God will pass it all understanding, will keep your heart in mind. And for us as a military town, it's a special word because Paul was using a word that the Romans would understand, will garrison your heart. There is a ring around us of peace. And we may not feel it all the time, but it is there. And nothing can take that away. The peace of God which passes all our understanding. Peace I leave with you. And it's bequeathed to us, it's part of his will for us. And if we're outside of that peace, look into your own heart and say, why is that, why is that gone? What am I doing? Where, where am I displeasing you, Lord? What is it? Don't, not, a, not a witch hunt, you don't have to, you might need somebody to help you through that, but what, what has entered into me? What are the names for suffering in your child? Why am I not living up to my potential? Why, why am I living where I am? I'm not talking about physically now, because I know for some it's not easy. I'm talking about where are you living in Christ? And so this dear man walking along with the rest of everybody crazy, he felt like perhaps somebody else here today thinking, yeah, I stood up and I did it. But if you only knew, if you only knew. My prayer as we look at the scripture together and as we pray, talk together is that we'll be willing to be where we are to trust God in that. And if necessary, to move away from the things that tempt us and from the things that attract us. To move away from the things, you, you know, there, there are things, aren't there, that when we're low, we go back into, it might be alcohol, it might be drugs, it might be all sorts of things. It might be, well, it might be anything. But we know as Christians what grieves God. The Holy Spirit teaches us the things that please Him. And I implore you and beg of you, if you want to walk the Christian walk, you've got to do something about it as well. Amen. You have to. The, you know, the scripture says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And the salvation I have got is what God has given me, and the value of that and the quality of that is how I choose to live. And if I neglect the word of God, if I neglect prayer, if I neglect fellowship, if I neglect the thing the Lord has put around me, if I no longer see beauty in my life that God has put there, then somewhere along the line I need to come before God and say, please, Lord, help, I'm in distress. Help, I'm not like others. Help, I don't want to be like others. I want to be like you, Lord, just like you. I cried out to the Lord and he heard me. It doesn't say actually in this particular psalm that this man got through it. That's a bit tough, isn't it? We, we like a happy ending, don't we? And I know people aren't going to have a happy ending. And you do too. And people who won't have a happy ending because they refuse to set aside the things that have held them and bound them over the years. My prayer for you and my longing for you, in whatever situation you are, to have to seek help if you need it, is to come out of that darkness, out of that despair, out of that place of oh, oh, just feeling that there's no peace. If necessary, Get away from the people who bring you down. You know, we need to do that sometimes. It doesn't mean we're better than them. But I know that if, if I know somebody who would, would depress me, I wouldn't particularly want to walk with them. I might still love them in Christ, but I wouldn't want to walk with them. Choose people who will help you. Walk together, bless each other. Is that too hard a thing to do? I'm sure it isn't. But I'll leave it there, because my legs are getting tired. <laughs> You're, you're going to sleep, and I don't want to. I'm not, I'm not here to send you to sleep. <coughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> but it's a joy to talk. It's a joy to sing. It's a joy to just talk about what the Lord has done. And, and it was just that psalm that, that got into my heart and said, just ask them where they are. Just ask them to look at their own lives, not measure them by anyone else, and say, from the day when I came to Christ, has there been a difference? Are there things I used to do that I do them no more? 
other things I need to walk away from, things that people have put upon me, do I need to begin to walk in him and in him alone, in Christ alone. Not easy, never will be easy, but it's worth it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I want to pronounce a blessing on this dear group of people. From so many varied backgrounds, some from comfort, some from discomfort, some from childhood that has been uh, uh, difficult, some from happy, but Lord, we're, we're amazed. And Lord, we're very sorry for the things that we do and are probably still doing that, that block you out and stop you from developing all the things that you put into us. And we thank you, Lord, for the things that don't depend upon money or education or any such thing, they might be helped, but they don't depend upon. What have you put into us, Lord, that you want to develop? We cry out in our distress. We cry out and say, Lord, we want to be at peace. We want to come out of the black tents of Kedah. We want to come out of the, the lower time of, type of living that, that dismisses you. And we want, as we sang earlier, just to give out everything to you, that you may use us for your glory. Lord, I pray that you would bless everyone here today. Bless them and keep them. May the light of your countenance shine upon them and give each one of them your peace.